Okay, let's begin. Okay, hey guys, do me a favor. I just did part two. Nehemiah, can you go on my page and see if it's working? Can you go to my page and see if it's working? All right. All right. Can you guys go see if my page is working? Close the door if you guys don't mind. What? Okay, well, because we're going to hear noise in the background. But it's okay. Leave it slightly open if you want. All right. Let's begin by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nehemiah. Okay, it's working. Praise Jesus our Lord. Let's continue where we left off. Is it clear? Genesis 18. God, Jehovah, the creator, is in human form, appearing to Abraham. Well, that was, that was clear, right? It's also clear there's another Jehovah in heaven. So we have a Jehovah on earth, Jehovah in heaven, proving the Jehovah on earth is Christ, right? Now in John 1, what did John 1 say? John 1 said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, meaning God the Father, and the Word was God in nature. That Word became flesh. So here, Christ is identified as that Word that was with God the Father, who later became flesh. Revelation 19, 13, where it said that Jesus Christ is the Word of God, Revelation 19, 13, and in 1 John 1, 1, 1 John 1, 1, he is called the word of life. Now, for those of you listening in Pal Talk YouTube, no side discussion. Focus on what I'm saying. Ask a question relevant to the topic or answer a question or praise the triumph God. Everlasting Father does not mean Christ is God the Father. I'll address that. Let's be patient. What I want to show you is another place where Abraham saw Jesus Christ. Let's focus. Where did Jesus appear to Abraham besides Genesis 18? Very easy. Remember who Jesus is? The Word, right? Was he with God the Father before creation? Yes, that's John 1, 1 to 3. It says that he was with God in the beginning. All things came into being through him. Nothing came into being through him. You know, nothing came into being without him. That, in other words, he created everything. So John 1, 3. The Word was there creating all things with the Father, right? So he's there in the beginning. All right, now, Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. Light, is this blessing you, sister? Because these are the arguments you'll be using to share with your Joe Witness friends. Renee, is this helping you? Everyone else, is this blessing? Because some of you already know this, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm proving that Abraham knew Jesus and was saved because he knew Jesus. Therefore, Abraham was a Christian. Don't shy away from affirming that. Don't be ashamed of asserting that. Jesus said Abraham was a Christian. Because what is a Christian? A believer, a follower of Christ. End of story. Christ left the tomb empty. I take his word over any philosopher, scholar, theologian. Christ is Lord. Now, Genesis 15. Let's read the first three verses. Here's another place where our Lord appears to Abraham in his pre-human existence. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 3. Read out loud for me. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Yahweh came to Abraham. The word of Jehovah, the Lord, came to Abraham. Or at this time, he's not called Abraham. Abraham. Pay attention. Abraham. Yes, go ahead. In a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, before you go on, guys, did you, everyone hear me say that Abraham is a Christian? Did everyone hear me say here and in Paltok that Abraham is a Christian? Yes. You heard it, right? Yes. Because here, guitar song, I don't know if guitar is busy playing on the guitar. Uh, she goes, hmm, I thought I heard you say Abraham was a Christian. Yes, you heard right. He is a Christian. So I don't know why you would think that when I said that clearly, explicitly. Now, okay, start again at verse 1. Guitar, let me send you on your merry way. Maybe you can join John Lennon and start singing the blues with him. All right? All right. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 3. Go ahead. One or... Start at 1 again because we have people here who want to question that Abraham was a Christian. Genesis 15, 1. 1 to 3, yeah. After these things, the word of the Yahweh came to Abraham in a vision, saying... Do not be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord, God. So he's, he's talking to God Almighty. Because in Hebrew, that's Adonai Yahweh or Adonai Yahweh. Sovereign Lord, Adonai Yahweh. That's a title that you can only give to the true God. So Abraham knows that this is God appearing to him. So what does he say to God? And Abraham said, 
Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing um, I go childless, and the heir of my house is the laser of the mystics. Eliezer is also known as Lazarus. Lazarus. Eliezer is the Hebrew wor word where we get Lazarus from. So what is Abraham basically saying? Look, he's saying, look, if I have no children, all my inheritance will go to my servant Eliezer. He will inherit me. So is that how you're going to reward me, God? Or are you going to give me a, a son to inherit me? So now watch what happens. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house in, is my heir. Yeah. A servant born in my house is going to be my heir. Is that how you're going to bless me and reward me? You said that you're my God, I'm your servant, and you're going to be with me. A servant born in my house is going to be my heir? Really? And then what does God say? Pay attention. And behold, the word of the Yahweh came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. So God swears. Guys, pay attention in Jesus' name. Focus as the Spirit fills you, because I want you to catch this. The Lord God swears, no, 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 no. Your servant won't inherit you. From your own loins, from your own body, you'll have a son. He'll be your heir. And then now notice what the Lord God is going to do in the next verse. Pay attention. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now before you read 6, did you see what God did? Brought him outside. Outside of what? Brought him outside. Outside of what? In tent. So then who appeared inside the tent? Because that means Jehovah didn't simply speak from heaven and Abraham heard an audible voice. And didn't simply see a vision. Because again, you have to be careful. Although verse 1 says Abraham saw a vision, right? Does your translation say Abraham had a vision? Okay, because you guys look like I'm shocked, especially I'm shocked. Like, what? Here's the thing where it gets a little tricky. Oftentimes, the word vision is used by Bible writers not to refer to something that you're seeing in your mind with your mind's eye. It can also refer to something actually taking place on earth. You guys want proof of that? When Paul saw Christ, did he see Christ actually appearing to him in the earth, or was it a vision? Meaning something he saw in his mind's eye that if you're standing next to Saul, you wouldn't see it. If I was there when Paul got converted, would I have seen something or only Paul saw something because he was seeing it with his mind's eyes and no one else? No, then you haven't read the text. It says the people there saw the light and they heard the voice but couldn't understand because he was speaking Aramaic. No, you're off. It wasn't just Paul. They all saw it. You understand? So why you don't speak off the cuff, understand, read carefully. Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. It says, the people with Paul saw the light, heard a voice, didn't see a form in the light, couldn't understand the speech because Jesus was speaking Aramaic to Paul. Why do I mention that? It wasn't something that Paul saw with his mind's eyes. It was something that took place in time and space. That means the Lord himself entered time and space and appeared visibly so that everyone saw something, right? You know why I, I want to highlight that? Because Paul called that a vision. He said, that was a vision that I had of Jesus. Acts 26, 19. Go to Acts 26, 19. So in your Western mind, when I say vision, you're thinking something you're seeing in your own mind. Although it is real, it's real to you because someone else next to you won't see it, right? Only you're seeing it. So you're seeing it with your mind's eyes. Or if the dimension of heaven opens and God allows me to see it, not someone else, that's what we call a vision because someone else is not seeing it, right? That's not how the Bible uses the term vision. Vision can mean a dream you're seeing or you're awake and you're seeing something through your mind's eyes that someone else is not seeing. Or it can refer to an encounter with God that's taking place in time and space where God does appear visibly. The term vision has a broad range of meaning. In Genesis, I'm sorry, Acts 26, 19, read to me. If you want the context, you start at 12. In fact, start at 12. Go to Acts 26, 12 to 19. Everyone in Paltok, are you following with me? You understand what a vision means? 
Usually when we use the word vision, we refer to something that you're seeing with your mind's eyes that someone next to you may not see. Unless God also opens his mind's eyes. That is a very limiting definition of vision. The Bible uses the word vision not just for the things you see in a dream or in a wakeful state through your mind's eyes, but also to God or angels appearing in time and space in, in full view of multiple witnesses. Vision is also used for that. To prove it to you, Acts 26, 12 to 19. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to give you two examples. Acts 26, 12 to 19. We're almost done. 26. 12 to 19. 12. Yes. Why thus occupied as I Jordan to Damascus with authority and <laughs> from the chief priests? At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun of shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to, to the ground. Why did they fall? Read it again. Let her pay that. Read it one more time. And when we all had fallen. No, but read the verse before that. She so she see why they fell. Thirteen. Yeah. At the midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. Yeah. And when we had, and when we all had fallen. So why did they fall again, Michelle? Not because they heard a voice. The light also knocked them down, right? And they hid themselves from the light. The light blinded Paul. The others covered up in time, right? And by the grace of God. So there, was it only one person who saw it? Or they were seeing an actual light in time and space manifest? But So they were seeing an actual light, right? Manifest, right? But this light was not the light of the sun or the light of the physical universe. This was the, the light of Jesus manifesting actually in time and space from this dimension we call heaven. Keep reading. See what's going to happen. I heard the voices speaking to me and saying in Hebrew See? language. Hebrew also means Aramaic. Yeah, because when you speak of Hebrew, it means the dialect of the Jews. And Aramaic was the dialect they spoke, so they would call it Hebrew. Right? But it's Aramaic. But keep going. So, so, why are you persecuting me? Mm -hmm. It is hard for you to uh, kick against... The goat? the goat? You know what a goat is, right? Goat is a, a cow prodder. Have you ever seen a cow prodder? It's like a huge stick with a nail at the end. You prod cows. So that's what a goat is. So it's hard for you to kick against the goats because you kicking against the goat is only going to hurt you. You're not hurting me. You're hurting yourself by fighting and resisting me. All right, keep going. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But Keep on. rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Yep. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Keep reading. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now notice 19 what he says. Here's the key verse 19. Read 19. Therefore, King Ephraim, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Wait, it's a vision? See, if I use vision for you guys, what would you think a vision is? Not something that takes place in time and space for others to see, but something in your mind, right? It doesn't mean it's not real. It is happening, but it's only happening to you, right? That's not how the Bible defines vision. That's only one definition. So be careful when you hear about a vision. Don't then define it from your 21st century standard. Vision in the Bible can refer to something you see visually in your mind's eye. No one else sees it or a dream, or something that takes place in time and space that others can see as well. So in Genesis 15, where it says Abraham had a vision, that doesn't mean it was something he was seeing with his mind's eye, only he was seeing it. So if I was sitting next to Abraham, hey Abraham, what's going on with you? What? What do you see, right? No, it's something taking place in time and space. So understand term vision has a broader meaning. Is that clear to every one of you? 
I know it's hot on you guys, but that's because the Spirit is keeping you on fire for Jesus. Amen? So now going back to Genesis 15, where it says he brought him outside. And by the way, Ed Van, Van Halen, that's Acts 26, 12 to 19. Acts 26, 12 to 19. That was what we were reading. But going back to Genesis 15, verse 5, it says he took him outside and showed him the stars. This means God again is appearing in actual time and space. It's not simply something that Abraham's seeing with his mind's eye. It's an actual encounter where God actually shows up on earth again in visible form. So he's inside the tent, and he says, come on out. Come out with me. And then he shows him the stars. He goes, Abraham, look at the stars. When you count them, that's how many your descendants will be. So again, God is appearing visibly in time and space, face to face with Abraham in the tent. But now watch verse 6. Watch verse 6. And he believed in Yahweh, and he accounted to him for righteousness. You know what's amazing? Genesis 15, 6 is cited by Paul in Romans 4, verse 3, and in Galatians chapter 3, specifically 3, verse 6. So write down Romans chapter 4, verse 3, right? Romans chapter 4, verse 3, and Galatians 3, 6. Paul quotes this passage, Genesis 15, 6, to affirm his doctrine of justification. And what is his doctrine of justification? That when a person believes in, trusts in God, God will then justify him. In order to prove that you are justified, not by works, but by faith and trust in God alone. He quotes Genesis 15, verse 6. But you know what's astonishing? Abraham had faith that pleased God from Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 14, all those years, Abraham had faith that pleased God. You know how I know that? How do I know that Abraham had faith that delighted God, that pleased God, long before Genesis 15? How do I know this? Does anyone know how I know this? Come on, help me. No, yeah, that's true. But maybe that wasn't true faith. You know how we know? Hebrews 11, 8 to 10. It says, by faith, Abraham lived as a stranger in a foreign land. And there it's the faith that pleases God. So Hebrews says, that's the kind of faith that pleases God. The kind of faith that Abraham had already in Genesis 12. So that means Abraham delighted God because of the faith he had since Genesis 12. Then why is it God waits till Genesis 15 to take his faith and use that faith to justify him? The, uh, Hebrews 11, 6. Yep. And uh, Genesis 15, 1. Say the same thing. Yeah, you got it. I know it's what you're going with this. Reward. Yeah, yeah, rewarder. But in Hebrews 11, 3, talks about that he made all things vis invisible by his word. But yes, Hebrews 11, 6, you have to believe in God in order... To, to delight God, and if you do, then he'll reward you. Exactly. But why does he wait till Genesis 15, though? If already in Genesis 12, because you're right. And already in Genesis 12, Hebrews 11, 8 to 10 says, already in Genesis 12, Abraham exhibited the kind of faith that delights God, the kind of faith that God then rewards, according to Hebrews 11, 6. He already had in Genesis 12. Why is it that it isn't until Genesis 15 that God then credits that faith as righteousness in other words, it's only in Genesis 15 where Abraham's faith is accepted by God in a justifying manner. That's when God accepts his faith to justify him, according to Paul. Why? Why? Come on, serious students of the Bible. Come on, Paul, talk. Wake up. Come on. Why? Maybe at that time he declared it to him, but from the beginning he was justified. I agree with you, because he was justified. He had to be had saving faith, right? The light. The what? The light. But he already received in Genesis 12. Is he more established his faith as a result of all he went through? Yeah, but see, that's the thing. If God waits for you to be more established in your faith to justify it, then that means it's not simple trust from the beginning. So God has to wait, right? Then that wouldn't be the doctrine of justification that we believe in. No, not, none of that. It was right in front of your face. It's because this is the first time we are to, told the word of God appeared to him. Did you even read it, verse 1? The word of the Lord appeared to Abraham. 
This is the first appearance of the Word of God who later became flesh. This is when he first shows up to Abraham, Genesis 15. Read it again, verse 1. You got it. Shabbat said it. Because here is where the Word appeared to him, made an oath, and he trusted the Word. And because he believed in the Word, the Word then justified him. Who appeared to Abraham in Genesis 15? Verse 1, it tells you. And the Word of Jehovah appeared to Abraham in a vision, saying, did you guys miss it? Read it, sister. Verse 1 in Genesis 15. Who appeared to Abraham? No, you're not reading it. No, no, not you guys. Her. She goes, Yahweh. She's not reading her own Bible. Read it again. It didn't say Yahweh. It said the word of the Lord. How'd you miss it, sister? Who appeared to him? Read verse uh, uh, verse four. It didn't say the Lord. It said the word of the Lord came to him, and it was the word of the Lord that took him out of the tent, and it was the word of the Lord who said to him, "Count the stars. That's how many your descendants will be." That's the word in John one, who then became flesh. So here you have Old Testament proof. That Jesus the Word was already appearing to the Old Testament saints long before he became flesh. So why was Abraham justified? Because he believed in the Word of the Lord. Why are you justified? Because you believe in the Word of the Lord who became flesh, Jesus Christ. Abraham was saved the same way you are. The only difference is he believed in the Word before he became flesh. You now believe in the word after he became flesh. Is there any doubt that Abraham saw Jesus, knew Jesus, spoke to Jesus, trusted Jesus, loved Jesus, and was justified by Jesus? Any doubt? Then where in the world do people get in saying that Abraham was a Jew? He wasn't. He was a Christian. Two final examples, and I'm going to dismiss you guys. I hope this busts you, sister, and challenge you. Did it challenge you guys? I don't know about you. You always look angry, but hopefully, you know, one day I'll see a smile on your I face. I agree with you. It's a, good. Then that means you're right. If you agree with me, that means you're close to the kingdom. Yeah. Zechariah 4, 8 to 9. Two final ones. Huh? Well, if you agree with me, that means I have to have said something for you to agree with. I'm sorry. Zechariah 4, 8 to 9. Do two final examples. Lord willing, I'm going to have to do part two on this next week to continue because I focus just on Abraham. I'm going to show you David knew Jesus, believed Jesus, hoped in Jesus, and was saved by Jesus. David, I'll show you that from the words of David and the words of Christ, confirming that David knew who Jesus was because the Spirit made it known to him a thousand years before the birth of our Lord. Lord willing, I'm going to have to do that next week because my time is almost up. Zechariah 4, 8 to 9. Pay attention, everyone, especially in the back. Remember what John 1 said? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh, right? Okay, now let me see if you catch it in Zechariah 4, 8 to 9. You guys on Peltuck, you want to sleep on me? Completely silent. 8 to 9. That's right, good. All right. Are you, is this making sense to you guys on Peltuck? I know some of you heard this already, but I have to repeat things over and over again by the grace of God until it becomes second nature. Okay, Zechariah 4, 8 to 9. Let's see if you guys on Peltuck land catch this. Zechariah 4, 8 to 9. Read out loud, Master. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. Oops, sorry. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh, you know what I did? I accidentally bounced Cavalier. Uh, can you have Cavalier instant message me? I was trying to bounce somebody else. You see this? You see? Satan's agents. Oh, my goodness. Hold on. Okay. Who who appeared to the... Okay. Did you guys read that? Read it again. Who was it that appeared? The word of who? And then the word of Lord said what? Sent me to you. Did you guys catch it? 
especially in the back. Read what it said. Yeah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, the hand of Zerubbabel will lay down the foundation. And when he does, then you will know that the Lord of hosts sent me to you. The word is speaking and saying, the Lord sent me the word to speak to you, Zechariah, these words. And when these words come to pass, then you'll know that I, the word, was sent by the Lord. So the word here is a living person sent by God to speak to the prophets. Now, Jeremiah 1, our last one, and we're done. Jeremiah 1, our last one, and we're done. Poor guy, man. I just bounced this guy accidentally. Huh? Jeremiah chapter 1, 4 to 10. Okay, let me see if I can add. Ah, oh, I accidentally bounced this guy. Okay, hold on. Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. Read slowly. Read 4 and 5 for me. Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5. Yeah. Then the word of the Yahweh came to okay, me. Okay, one more time. Read it. Then the word of the Yahweh came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nation. Okay. Read one, one, four, and five one more time for me. One more time. Okay. I want to see if you guys caught it. Okay, read it. Then the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Yes. Behold, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Who formed them in the womb? The word of Yahweh. Is there one catching it or no? But that's John 1, 1 to 3. Remember what John 1, 1 to 3 said? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by the Word, and nothing has been made without the Word that has been made. So John 1 says, the Word created everyone. So here it says, the Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and he said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and I appointed you to be a prophet. Who said that? The Word said that. The word is speaking to Jeremiah as if he's God, the creator. Everyone, Peltak, did you see that? But continue reading now from 6 down to 9. 6 down to 9. All right? Read that for me. said, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. So he knows the word is the Lord God. He, remember, he said the word of the Lord came to me, but he knows this word, although sent by God, is also God. That's John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So Jeremiah says, the Word of the Lord came to me, and that Word is my God. He's the Lord God. So he knew that before John wrote it. Jeremiah knew all this before John wrote it. The only new thing that John added was that the Word became flesh. That's the only thing new. But keep reading. But Yahweh said to me, do not say I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I sent you, and whenever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says Yahweh. Keep on, all the way to nine. Then the Yahweh put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Wait, Yahweh had a hand, and his hand actually touched Jeremiah's physical mouth? Yahweh stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. Now read all the way to 10. And, the, and Yahweh said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Wow, so the word of Yahweh is identified as Yahweh. He's the one who created Jeremiah in the womb. He's the creator. He's the one who appointed Jeremiah to be his prophet. And he appears in visible form to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah sees his visible hand reach out and say, Look, I'm putting my words in your mouth because you're going to speak my words to these nations. If I didn't tell you this was Old Testament, you'd think this is a Christian writing it. But hold on. A Christian did write it. Jeremiah knew the word before he became flesh, trusted in the word, loved the word, hoped in the word, and knew the word was his creator and savior long before the New Testament's written. So isn't this proof that Zechariah, Jeremiah, and Abraham, all three of them, encountered the word of God a living, dynamic person who would speak to them, who appointed them, who would empower them, and all of them knew that this word, although sent from God, was also God, their creator, sustainer, and savior. That means now you have evidence that all of them were Christians even before Christ became flesh. What else do you need? So if someone asks you the question, what was the religion of the Old Testament saints? No doubt they all knew 
loved and followed Jesus. They were Christians before Christ became flesh. Lord willing, this was part one. Do you want me to do part two next Friday, Lord willing? Yes. How many amens? Amen. All right. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Officially, this part of class is over. You're dismissed. Lord, watch over you. Lord willing, see you next Friday. Bathe my wife and daughters in me in prayer that God provide for us, sustain us, and love us, and that we glorify Jesus. He is worthy. I'll give you guys a minute to be dismissed. Pray for the ministry. You want to support. There's a plate there. God bless you. Christ is risen. For the rest of you, I'm going to take Q&A for another 20 minutes. Hope you guys are blessed. And praise the Lord, this was recorded. Don't forget, next Friday, guys, Lord willing, part two. And during the week, for those of you on Paltok, I'll be doing part three of the Christology of the Quran, Lord willing. Part three of the Christology of the Quran, Lord willing. You can go on my YouTube page, Shamunian. All these recordings are there. Subscribe. Pass it on. Come on, build up my page. All right. God bless you, Nasser. Thank you for service. I love you, brother. God bless you, sisters. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Yes, I'm going to do it right now. I am his. I'll do Isaiah 9, 6 as the first question. What does it mean that Jesus is everlasting Father? Go ahead, brother. What is it? The Lord uh, made all judgment to the, to the Son as a, as a result of what He's done for mankind. Well, he, he remember, He was already judging before what He did for mankind, right? So it, it, that's part of it because if you read Colossians, everything exists for Jesus. That's why He comes to save it, right? Yeah. He was slain before the Father. Yes. But why was He slain, not the Father? Because Colossians 1 says, All things were created by Him for Him. I mean, the Father, I'm recording, messing up there. The Father appointed the Son to be the heir of everything. So when the Father, Son, and Spirit created creation, they all created it for the glory of the Son as their expression of love for the Son. So yes, this is why he judges and saves, because it's all for him. It's all for him. And, and if he's not God, that's blasphemy, isn't it? Because that means God is creating all creation for a creature. So that all creation glorifies a creature the way they glorify God. Exactly. 100%. So you're right. He judges because he redeems, but he redeems because he owns it. It was made for him. So who better than the heir and the owner of creation to come and redeem it? And who else could judge it but the one who owns it? He owns you, so he has every right to judge you because your life is his gift to you. And he's going to call you an account. What did you do with the gift I gave you? Right? So Christ is Lord indeed. Okay, ladies, I got to answer a question, Isaiah and I. If you guys want to talk, you can talk out there. Close the door. God bless. Thank you, the Lord's mercy is new every Hallelujah. And pray that he will always be merciful to all of us, especially me, the worst of sinners. Hold on, guys. I want to answer Isaiah 9-6. If you want to see it, please. I'll make sure you're all up. You guys going to stick around until I'm done? I'm done. 20 minutes will be done. I know you're tired. Hold on. Yeah, 20 I'll be done because I got to answer this question. It's one question, Isaiah 9 six. Okay, let's answer Isaiah 9, 6, and we're going to call it a night. Are you guys ready? Now I'm going to need Ed Van Halen's help or Eno's help or someone's help, right, uh, to post verses. Okay, Isaiah 9, 6. This is often misused, misapplied by oneness heretics to prove that Jesus is God the Father. Okay? Isaiah 9, 6. This is the only question I'll take. I'll answer thoroughly. It's being recorded, and then we'll be done. So Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, El Gibor, a title of Jehovah in Isaiah 10, 21. Everlasting Father, Abiyad, the Prince of Peace. See here, the son who is born, who's the Mighty God, who will be the Messiah, Jesus, is called the Everlasting Father, Abiyad. First, of, first off, Number one, he's not called God the Father. That's right off the bat. He's called the Everlasting Father. That doesn't mean the same. In fact, if calling Jesus the Father would make him God the Father, then that means... Abraham is our Father, and so is God. Does that make Abraham God the Father? Ed Van Halen, do me a favor. Post John 8, 39 to 41. John 8, 39 to 41. So let me deal with this passage that's often misused and abused, distorted to prove that Jesus is someone that he's not. 
Just because Jesus is the everlasting Father doesn't make him God the Father. Because we have many fathers in the Bible, but we don't have fathers in the same sense that God the Father is our Father. Because notice in John 8, 39, 41, Light, Rene, everyone else, read with me. <clears throat> they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man, that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then say, said they to him, watch this, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. That's even more powerful. In 39, they said, Abraham is our father. But then in 41, they said, we have one father, even God. So if they have only one father, that's God, then for Abraham to be their father, that means Abraham's God the father. Would anyone buy that logic? So I just prove by this logic, Abraham is God father. 41, we have one father, even God. So if there's only one father, that's God, and Abraham is their father, that means Abraham's God the father. Now, which person would buy into that logic? That's nonsense. Because Abraham is their father in a different sense than God the father is. Yes, they only have one father in the sense that God is their father. You can have an earthly father, you can have a spiritual father, but that doesn't make them identical to God the Father because he's your father in an absolute sense, in a different sense from the rest. So just because the word father is used of more than one individual doesn't mean they're the same individual. Is everyone with me here? Or am I confusing you guys? You guys in Pal Talk, is it making sense? Clear? Okay, Romans 4.16. How many fathers do we have? Well, you only have one father. Romans 4, 16. Let's see how many fathers do we have. How many fathers did Corinthians have? Let's see. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, if it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So here Abraham is every believer's father. Abraham is every believer's father. All right? Okay. But Matthew 23, 9 says, Call no man on earth father, for one is your father, namely God in heaven. Matthew 23, 9. So post that for me at Van, Van Halen. Matthew 23, 9. <clears throat> Matthew 23, 9. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Okay, now here I'm confused. Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Abraham is the father of all believers. Jesus says, you only have one father in heaven. So using the logic of these modalist heretics, if only God is my father who's in heaven, and yet Abraham's my father, then the conclusion is Abraham's God the father. Nonsense. That's not what these passages are saying. Abraham is our father in a different sense from God the father. Likewise, Jesus is the everlasting father, not because he's God the father, but because he's the father of eternity the source of eternity, the one who gives life to all his people, the one who preserves his people, who sustains his people because he saves his people. So he's your father in that sense, without being God the Father. And I'll expound that a little more. I'm going to expound that a little more. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians 4.15. 1 Corinthians 4.15. 1 Corinthians 4.15. Is it making sense to all of you guys in Paltop? I'm trying to repeat the same point more than once to make sense. If you're getting confused, let me know. 1 Corinthians 4.15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul says, look, you Corinthians, you have many instructors, tutors. Christ has sent you many teachers. But you only have one father. Me, Paul, who begot you. Paul begot them? So they're the children of Paul? So Paul is their father? Yes, he goes, spiritually, I begot you. Because it was through my, my mouth you got saved. It was through my mouth you heard the gospel. So in that sense, you're my children, my fruit from the gospel. Does that mean because Paul is their father who begot them? Paul is God the father? Is Paul God the father? Would anyone argue that? Would any modalist argue that Abraham and Paul are God the father? 
What about Adam? Is Adam not the father of us all? Are we not all sons and daughters of Adam? So that our ancestor, does that mean Adam being your father is God the father? You see the problem with saying, just because Christ is called father, that somehow makes him God the father. That's nonsense. That shows that the person does not know how to interpret the Bible. So now that I've shown you that Jesus can be called the Father without being God the Father, is that clear to everyone in Peltoc? Jesus can be called everlasting Father without being God the Father. Let me explain what it means for Christ to be everlasting Father. Are we ready now? Are we ready? Put a one if you're ready. If you're still confused, put a two. If anyone's confused, put a two. All right. Literally, the Hebrew is Abi Ad. Abiad. Abiad literally means father of eternity. That's the literal translation of the Hebrew. Don't take my word for it. Go to interlinearbible.org, or if you can read the Hebrew text, read it. You'll see the word is Abi, which can mean my father or father of Ad. Abiad means father of eternity. Here, Jesus is not being called so much everlasting father as he's being called father of eternity. Now, what does it mean, father of eternity? The word father is often used in scripture to refer to the possessor or source of something. Like the father of strength is the possessor of strength. The father of beauty is the possessor of beauty. So why is Jesus being called father of eternity? Because he's the one who possesses, who is the source of eternity. Meaning that eternal life, life originates from him. He's the possessor of everlasting life the possessor of everlastingness, meaning the source of never-ending life, and that's why our life comes from Him. This is simply another way of saying that Jesus is the author of life, Acts 3.15, and that in Him was life, John 1.4. So if you want to know what Father of Eternity means in reference to Christ, it means that Jesus is the possessor of eternity, the possessor of eternal life, and because he's the possessor of that quality, he is the one who gives it to all who believe in him. And this is echoed in John 1.4. It says, in Christ, in him was life. That's also found in Acts 3.15, where it says, you killed the author of life. Notice Jesus is the author of life. Same thing as saying, father of eternity, possessor of eternity, source of eternity. The one from whom everlasting life originates your eternal life your everlasting life your never-ending life comes from him so he's your father in the sense that he gives you life everlasting not because he's god the father is that one clear with me do you guys get it is it making sense for you guys in pal talk right further proof that jesus is the father turned in the sense that Five seventeen say, Jesus is before all things, and in Him, Jesus, all things consist. In Christ comes the life by which He sustains all life. In Christ comes the power that sustains and gives life to all creation. That's what it means for Him to be the Father of eternity. Not that He's God the Father, but with the Father and the Spirit, He gives life and sustains life and preserves believers forever. That's Colossians 1.17. Also Hebrews 1.3, who sustains, upholds all things by his powerful word. So who's sustaining me? Who's sustaining you? Who's giving you life? Who's giving you breath? Who will sustain you for all eternity? The Lord Jesus by his powerful word. Why? Because he's the source, the possessor of eternity. Is that clear? Are you guys getting it? Colossians 3.4, it says Christ our life. Christ, our life. Could the Bible be any clearer what it means for Christ to be everlasting Father? Not that he's God the Father, but with the Father and the Spirit, he's the possessor and source of life, the one who gives life, the one who sustains life, the one who gives us never-ending life. Let me give you more verses. John 5, 25. The hour is coming, and it is now, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall live. John 5, 25. Then in 26, he says, For just as the Father has life in himself, 
so too he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So the Father and the Son have life in themselves. That's the life that sustains all life, all creatures, both biologically and forever. Is that clear? Still not convinced? John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So you see what it means for him to be everlasting Father? Not that he's the Father. He's the one who brings you to the Father. He's the one who's one with the Father. He is the one who loves the Father and is loved by the Father. But like the Father, he's the source of life, the possessor of life, the sustainer who confers eternal life on all his creatures that believe in him. Still not convinced. John 11, 25, 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who believes and lives shall never die. Do you believe this? Still not convinced. John 10, 27 to 30. <clears throat> my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give them everlasting life. I, Jesus, give them everlasting life. They shall never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. My Father, who's given them to me, is greater than all. No one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father, we are one. What else do you need to show you and convince you Jesus is not the Father than John 10, 27 to 30, where he says, I and my Father, both of us sustain all believers. No one can pluck believers out of my hand or my Father's hand. Why? Because I and my Father, we are one. That verb are in Greek is esmen. Esmen in Greek literally means we are, plural, more than one. Could Jesus be any clearer? He's not the Father, but because he's one with the Father, he too with the Father is life, eternal life, the source of life, the author of life, the one who confers life because he is the Father of life, the Father of eternity. <clears throat> I hope that answered the question. Was that clear? That's the answer. Does everyone understand what everlasting Father means? He's not God the Father any more than Abraham is God the Father, any more than Adam is God the Father, any more than Paul is God the Father, because he's a father to us in a different sense from God the Father, in that he's not God the Father, but with the Father, he's our life giver, our sustainer, the one who pre preserves us, the one who confers eternity upon us because of his grace. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. I hope that was clear. So whoever, again, distorts, abuses, misinterprets Isaiah 9, 6 to try to prove that Jesus is God the Father, that person is an ignoramus who does not know God, does not know his word. Finally, final point. I want to make this final point. You ever with me? Is that clear? Jesus is not God the Father? He's also your father by virtue of being the last Adam. Remember the first Adam? We're all descended from the first Adam, because he's the father of humanity? Well, Jesus became man to become the last Adam. Let me give you the references. Romans 5, 14 to 21. Write these down. <clears throat> Romans 5, 14 to 21. We're not going to look at all of them. Romans 5, 14 to 21. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. Romans 5, not 14, brother. Don't deceive people before I stone you. Romans 5, 14 to 21, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, write these down, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, and 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. In these passages, Jesus is contrasted to the first Adam in that Jesus is the last Adam, who is the father, the head of a new humanity, born in him, transformed by him to bear his image, to become new creatures who become morally incorruptible and physically immortal. So by virtue of being the last Adam, in that sense, like the first Adam, he's the father of a true humanity, a renewed humanity, redeemed in him. And with that said, do me a favor, Ed Van Halen. Post 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. <clears throat> Pray for my voice that it stays strong and healthy. And the Lord anoints anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. You see, when I talk too much, I start losing my voice. 1 Corinthians 4, 15, 45, 49. So Lord willing, tomorrow is going to be a nice day, a nice break. 
spend it with my daughters as my wife is at work. First Corinthians 15, 45, 49. Let's read it. And so it is written, <clears throat> the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, hmm, the last Adam was made a life-giving, a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first, which is spiritual. In other words, the spiritual didn't come first. Jesus was the spiritual who became the last Adam. He came after the first Adam, right? But that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Now watch this. The first man is of the earth, earthy. He came from dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earth. In other words, if you are from Adam, the first Adam, you're like him of the earth, dust. So you're going to return to dust. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. But if you believe in Christ, you're no longer in the first Adam. Now you are part of the second Adam. And like the second Adam, your, your dwelling place is heaven. Just like Jesus is from heaven, that's where you belong with the last Adam who's heavenly. Therefore, you will be heavenly. That's what he's saying here, right? Now let's continue reading. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, see, I bore the image of Adam because he's my ancestor. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Did you catch it? Jesus is not God the Father, but he is my Father in that he's the last Adam. And my union with him results in my transformation to be like him in his humanity, in his physical body. So I'm going to be immortal like him and morally incorruptible like him. And beyond that, as God, he's my sustainer and life giver with the Father and the Spirit. I hope that answered it because that is the answer. No, he's not God the Father, but he truly is our Father, one with the Father and the Spirit, the Blessed Trinity. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Guys, pray for me, my family. Pray for the sport. You know what's shocking? I just saw a Patreon. I had about 15 supporters. I lost two. I'm down to 13. Instead of them increasing, they're decreasing. <laughs> Pray for me. God is our sustainer. Love you guys for the sake of the Lord. See you soon. Like, Renee, everyone else. Did it make sense what it means for Jesus to be everlasting Father? Is anyone confused? Put a two. And glory to God, it's recorded. So you can go listen to it on my YouTube page. Please subscribe to my page, Shamunian. And spread the page. Let's increase the number so more people can benefit and be blessed by these recordings. Love you for the sake of Jesus. Yes, Shamunian. S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. S-H-A-M-O-U-N-I-A-N. Subscribe. Spread it around for the glory of Christ. Christ is risen with indeed. Love you guys. Lord bless you. See you soon. I may see you tomorrow late night or Sunday if God wills. So look for me. Same back time, same back channel. Na -na 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 Batman. Take care. God bless. All right. Take care. Lord bless you guys. S man.